In this video, we're going to discuss N64 emulation on the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch. Alright everybody, I'm not going to lie, I don't really care for N64 emulation on the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch. There's no Vulkan support, so we don't get access to the best plugins, thus not getting the best compatibility and performance that we could versus other standalone devices that do support Vulkan. And because of this, there are a number of games that will have issues. For example, DK64 has a camera bug with the Glide64 plugin, but you can use the Angry Lion plugin to overcome this. But Angry Lion is very CPU intensive, so it will cause issues in a number of titles as well. So, I mean, there's no one size fit all solution when it comes to N64 emulation on the Xbox. But that being said, if you're willing to put in work, you can get a good experience out of nearly every title on the system. Well, except for Battle for Naboo, because that is far too demanding for Xbox. But let's go ahead and dive in. So to get started with N64 emulation on the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch, you need to install the Xbox Series X or S version of RetroArch. Doesn't matter if it's in dev mode or retail mode. Choose which one works best for you, get it installed, then continue along with this guide. Links to these install guides will be in the description below if needed. Now the only prerequisite to get N64 emulation up and running on the Xbox Series X and S is N64 games. So these can come in a variety of formats, Z64, .N64, .bin, or if you want to, you can compress them into zip format. But once you have your N64 games sourced, you just need to add them to your preferred storage media. So for my example, I'm going to be storing them on USB. So I'm just going to open up my USB drive, open up my games folder, and drag my N64 games right on in and let it do its thing. If you want to store them on your S drive under dev mode, you can open up Durango FTP, start your file share, and then back on your computing device of choice, you can access that Xbox file share. So then you'd enter into S, program files, windows apps, find your RetroArch folder with the X64 at the end, find the games folder that you created, during initial setup, and then drag your N64 games right in and let it do its thing. But once you have your games placed, we can move over to the Xbox. All right, so went ahead and got that USB drive plugged back into my Xbox and booted it into RetroArch, and now I'm ready to begin loading up N64 content. So what I like to do is make a games playlist, and to do this, you can head down to import content, and if your games are not zipped, you can go to scan directory. Navigate to the directory where you have your N64 games stored. So if you're using a USB drive under dev mode, it'll be an E. USB drive under retail mode will be in D. Or if you put them on the internal SSD, follow that S drive path. But for my example, E drive, games, N64 games, and I'm going to tell it to scan this directory and just wait for it to do its thing. Now, if you have your game zipped, you can go down and do a manual scan, choose your content directory, your system name, and your default core, which will be Moopin64 Plus next. And then make sure you have Scan Inside Archives turned on, and then you can start the scan there. But in the end, you should end up with a new Nintendo 64 playlist entry here on the left with all of your games inside. Now, one of the nice things about doing the scan directory method is you can head into the online updater, playlist thumbnails updater, and you can navigate to your Nintendo 64 playlist, press A on it, and it will download cover arts for the games that it was able to scan, typically. And now when I go to my N64 playlist, I'll have cover arts for a vast majority of my titles. There might be a few that it missed, but for the most part, it looks like it got them all. But from here, we are free to begin loading up N64 content, so just go ahead and choose a game and tell it to run. And then you might need to choose a core to run it from, so for this tutorial, we're using Moopin64 Plus Next on Xbox Series X and S. And there we go, N64 games being played on an Xbox Series X and S. And there have been some improvements to the Glide64 plugin since the first implementation on Xbox, so games like Hexen are playable right out of the gate without any settings needing to be changed, which is awesome. It didn't used to display your character or the background before, so big improvement there. Unfortunately, games like Resident Evil 2 still do not work right under default settings. As you can see, there are no displayed characters on screen. We have no idea where the zombies are. We have no idea where Leon is. So this is a game that needs some adjustments to settings before it will run properly. Now, Pokemon Snap is another one with a graphical bug. The dot in the middle of the Pokeball of the camera here doesn't turn red when you take a picture. And when you try to turn in a picture to Professor Oak, you cannot see any of the pictures that are being displayed, making the game pretty much unplayable. 
And then in DK64, things like the zipper transition effect are completely missing. And the camera is completely unusable because it tries to constantly reset behind you. Now, outside of problematic games, most things are going to run just fine under default settings for a vast majority of the popular titles on N64. For example, Super Mario 64. Might be a transition effect here or there that isn't quite implemented right, but the experience is decent. But with all of that said, there are a number of things that would need to be taken into consideration when it comes to N64 gaming on the Xbox Series X and S. So heading into the RetroArch Quick Menu and going down to the Options tab, you can see that our RDP plugin is set to Glide N64 by default. Now, again, this will work for a good majority of games, but there are just some glitches here and there on a number of titles, and it's just not quite as accurate as you'd hope in this day and age, honestly. But it lets you upscale your games, it lets you do all kinds of other fun effects, and HD texture packs and different things like that, so it's definitely preferred by a lot of people. So, for example, we can change our emulation up to 4K. Change our widescreen up to 4K. We can set our aspect ratio. So most N64 games ran in 4x3, but you can do a stretched 16x9 or a widescreen hacked 16x9 implementation. You can adjust the native rendering resolution. Enable a threaded renderer to get better performance at the cost of some extra input latency. Bilinear filtering mode, I like to change this to three point. And by the way, adjusting some of these settings will make games like Resident Evil 2 work. I like to turn on dithering. Can adjust MSAA, FXAA. Uh, one option you're gonna to want to turn on is copy auxiliary buffers to RD RAM. This will fix a number of graphical glitches in games like Paper Mario and many others. Depth buffer, I usually turn this to from memory. Background mode, if you want to have games like Resident Evil 2 work, change this from one piece to stripped. Hardware per pixel lighting. Continuous text rec coordinates, turn this to auto. Another one to turn on is native res 2D text recs. I like to turn this one on optimized. It'll fix issues in like Mario Kart. We don't need less accurate blending mode on. We got enough power of the GPU here. Turn on GPU shader depth right, but... Adjusting those settings will give you a bit more accuracy with the Glide 64 plugin and fix a number of games. But once you have them set, just go ahead and close out of your content, which will crash RetroArch, by the way. It's still an angle core. Angle core still crash RetroArch when you leave them. But just go back in. And now when we load back into games like Resident Evil 2, hey, look at that. We've got our characters and the zombies actually appearing on screen. As you can see, there's still some garbage data to be had here, but hey, the game is at least playable under Glide N64. And we got it upscaled a bit too, so nice. But let's go ahead and talk about if you want to get the most accurate experience out of your N64 emulation as possible. For this, we will want to change our RDP plugin from Glide over to Angry Lion and our RSP plugin over to CXD4. Now again, there are trade-offs between Angry Lion and Glide N64. You're going to lose out on upscaling and a number of advanced graphical features. This is an accuracy-based plugin, so it's trying to look like an N64 would look. But it also fixes practically every single game with no setting adjustments needed. You are just going to get a bit of performance dips in a number of titles just because of how CPU intensive it is. But for an overwhelming majority of N64 games, it's working awesomely on the Xbox Series X. Once you have the Angry Lion and CXD4 plugin set, just go ahead and back out, close your content, which will crash RetroArch once again. And then we can load back in. And now when I load into DK64, the zipper transition effects are working. The camera is no longer glitching and working as intended. So this game is now fully playable. Resident Evil 2 works right off the bat, and there's no longer any garbage data on the side of the screen, which is awesome. And with Pokemon Snap, the red dot is once again appearing on the Pokeball. That way you know you have the perfect shot lined up. Not the biggest deal, obviously, but still how the game was meant to be shown. 
And when we go to show pictures to Professor Oak, look at that, they actually appear so we can see them. Thus making the game once again fully playable. And even a super demanding game like Rogue Squadron runs just great under Angry Lion. Might be the occasional dip here and there, but for the most part the game is fully playable and quite awesome to say the least. Now, one of the downfalls of Angry Lion is that interlaced content is going to be interlaced, so you will see some visual lines going through stuff on 480i titles, like Rogue Squadron here. So going back to the great debate on which plugins you should be using, it really depends on if you don't want to mess around with a lot of settings and want to have a really representative N64 gaming experience versus upscaling and fancy uh, emulation effects. So for me personally, I prefer Angry Lion because it just is how N64 games look and you're not going to need to mess with things to get them to work right. But again, it is going to come at the cost of some performance hits and minor dips on some games. But going into the Angry Lion settings, you can see that there's really not much we can change here. The VI overlay one might be of interest to some people, so filtered is what an N64 looks like. You can change it up to make it so it has anti-aliasing only, getting rid of a lot of the blur. Sharpening up the picture quite a bit. Or you can have anti-aliasing plus de-dithering, or anti-aliasing plus blur. But if you just want that full accurate experience, leave it unfiltered. And then we have threaded sync levels, so the higher this is, the more demanding and more accurate it is, so leave it on low. And then multi-threading, leave that just to all threads to get the best performance. And then you can hide over scans on the borders if you so choose. But let's take a second to go over some of the other options available to us within Moopin64 Plus next. So, we've already talked about the RDP and RSP plugin quite a bit. That's kind of been the whole point of the video up till now. But our next option, frame duplication, I like to turn this one on. Frame rate, this will keep your N64 games running as they did back on the original hardware, so all frame dips and everything is present. If you want to try to reduce those, you can change this to full speed, and games like GoldenEye will run a lot faster. Next up, VI Refresh, this is another overclocking option, so you can change between 1500 and 2200, or you can leave it on auto just to have the default N64 behavior. Our next option is to disable the N64 expansion pack. Not much of a reason to turn this on, but it's fun to experiment with, uh, just to see content that wasn't available without an expansion pack in certain titles, like Perfect Dark or San Francisco Rush 2049. Next up, ignore emulated TLB exceptions. Just leave this on Don't Ignore, unless you're doing a lot of ROM hacks. And then the next two options, Count Per Op, Count Per Op Divider. Just don't mess with these. It will break a lot of stuff. It's another type of overclocking, but not really needed compared to frame rate and VI Refresh. And then next up we have the controller and controller pack options here. So analog dead zone. I like to turn this down to 5 or 0 depending on my controller. And then for analog sensitivity I change this one up to about 150%. This makes the Xbox controller feel a bit more authentic to an N64 experience. Numbers may vary depending on the controller but for me this is it's that nice little sweet spot. Then you could change the C button mappings. Independency button controls. A lot of this stuff isn't really that necessary considering the right analog stick is mapped to the C buttons. Player one pack. This is going to be where you choose between a memory pack or a rumble pack. You could also choose a transfer pack. If you want to try using the transfer pack on the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch, there's two methods of doing so. One is to rename your Game Boy save file and the ROM file into specific formats. So for example, they have Pokemon Stadium, here's the N64 game. Then they renamed the Game Boy save file Pokemon Stadium.z64.save. And then they renamed the Game Boy ROM Pokemon Stadium.z64.gb. That way all of them have basically the same title. And when you load up the game, it has the transfer pack stuff enabled automatically. Or a method I think is a little less convoluted. Open up your RetroArch saves folder, rename your... Game Boy save of choice from SRAM to save. Then you load up the core. Then you go to the subsystems and load up the Game Boy save. Load up the Game Boy game. And then load up the N64 game. And then when you load it up, it will be all set. A bit convoluted, but the setup steps are here. But then you can also set it for player 2, 3, and 4 as well. But that's pretty much going to cover it for N64 core options. If you have options you want to set for some games but not others, you can go into manage core options. 
and save them as a game options file. So for those of you that might want to have upscaling in certain games but not others, you can set the core to use Glide or to use Angry Lion, save them as a game options file, so that way you just get the best of both worlds depending on the title. Now one last thing I want to cover here real quick is the use of shaders. So you can enable video shaders in the shaders tab, and then you can load up a preset. So I'm going to head into the CRT presets here, and I'm going to load up CRT Royal. And now when I go back into Rogue Squadron, you can see I now have new scan line effects applied to the game. And it's looking pretty good, considering it's running at 640 by 320 or whatever resolution Rogue Squadron ran at, I can't remember. But shaders are a matter of personal preference, so go through them, find the one you like, and just run with it. And once you have the shader that you like, you can head back into the tab, go to the save option, and save them as a core preset, so that way every time you load up an N64 game, that's the option that will greet you. But that's going to do it for N64 emulation today as far as I'm going to cover it. Again, I'm not the biggest fan of N64 emulation on Xbox. It's not as straightforward as it is on PC or phones or any other number of devices that have true Vulkan support. That being said though, if you want to put in the work, you can get a very awesome N64 experience out of it. Or if you want to take the authentic route, you could just slap Angry Land on there and accept a couple of performance hits in some titles. It's really not that major and makes a number of things just far easier, thus it being my preferred method. But thank you so much as always for watching today's tutorial, it means the world to me that you spend even a minute on the channel and help us grow it. But I do have a couple of huge favors here at the end, if you haven't done so already hit that thumbs up, thumbs down button just depending on how much you like today's video. And if you haven't done so already hit that sub button and notification bell so you can see when new videos go live on the channel. I have a lot of content coming your way and I'd love to have you all along for the ride. For anyone interested in further helping support the channel, you can also check out that join button here on YouTube or the Patreon link in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. A little really goes a long way to keeping this place up and running and bringing this content to you. Big shout out to all current champions, y'all are amazing, thank you so much for believing in what we do. But until next time my wonderful internet peeps, you all stay awesome, keep on gaming, and we'll see you back next video.